bless your name. Lord, we bless your holy name. Jesus, we glorify you and thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and all that you have for us. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would open our ears to hear what you have to say to us tonight. Speak to us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name. Test, test. I apologize for being late. A friend of mine has been battling cancer. He asked me if, if a few friends of his and me would come over tonight right before our service and pray with him. So I'd like us to pray that God would touch him. His name is Josh, and he goes in tomorrow for an MRI. And I believe when he goes in tomorrow, God is able to heal him in such a way that the doctors will tell him there is no trace of cancer in his brain or in his body and that God has touched him and healed him. I, I believe God is able and willing to do miracles like that for his people. So would you join with me tonight? Let's pray for him, for Papa Sheets, for Brother Fortner. God will minister to them, to Sister Green. Anybody else who needs a, a miracle? We're going to pray for Tim Parsons in Jesus' name. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, Sister Potter. Okay. All right, we're going to pray for him. What's his name? Ashley? Ashley. Anybody else? Yes, Missy. Yes. Yes, in Jesus' name. Yes, Maria. <coughs> Absolutely. We will pray for you and for Henry in Jesus' name. Yes, Jessica. Pray for Jessica. Okay, let's take these needs. Remember, as many as you can, and let's pray for these in faith, in Jesus' name. Lord, we are coming to you. You're the healer of all of our diseases. Nothing is too hard for you to do, God. Nothing is too hard for you to heal. Nothing is too difficult for you to, to work a miracle. And I pray tonight, lift up my voice once again, and I pray for Josh Kirby. You are able to heal him of every trace of cancer in his brain and his body. You're able to work a miracle in him, Lord. You're able to do for him what only you can. And I am so thankful to call on your name. I pray Minister tonight to Brother Sheets and Brother Fortner. Both of those men need strength, need healing in their bodies. You're able, Lord, to raise them right up off of their bed and give them strength again. I ask you to touch them tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for Sister Green. Minister to her, Lord. Strengthen her body. Wherever she is, God, raise her up and strengthen her tonight. Go to where she is, I pray. 
for Tim Parsons. God, I ask you to heal his mind. God, I pray whatever depression he's dealing with and battling, that you would set him free and you would liberate him and give him joy, which only comes from you, Jesus. I pray tonight for Jessica, whatever she needs from you, God, you're well able to meet her need right here in this chapel. God, minister to her in this place, I pray. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. I pray for Missy. I ask you to minister in her request. I pray, God, you would heal and you would also fill them with the gift of your Holy Spirit, not only a healing in their body, but, Lord, I pray, fill them with your Spirit. We pray for Maria and for Henry that you would bless her and her baby, that you would minister to both of them, keep both of them safe, continue working in their lives, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you're going to do, God. I ask you to minister tonight to Ashley. I pray for healing. I pray for a miracle. I pray do what only you can do, God. We call on your name. You have called us to call on your name, and we're going to do just that and believe you to hear and heal and work miracles in the name of Jesus. You did it on Friday night. You did it on Sunday morning. Do it again tonight, we pray, and bless our Bible study. Speak to us and draw us close to you and your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There is so much faith that God is not only able but also willing to work on our behalf. I think Dropbox is just a little bit behind on syncing up. That's probably. You think Dropbox has gone on to be with Jesus? I put it on Dropbox. Yes, sir. All right, let me. Just a moment, my friends. Let me see if I can get this to go to another place. I can. I can. I can. You're beautiful, beautiful. Do you say time seven? Am I sending it to the Vernon Church at Gmail? Yes. All right, coming at you. The Amish are laughing at us. They say, we don't have these issues. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. All right, I just sent, sir. You should be receiving a link very soon. <coughs> how, many do, how many had the privilege to read Acts chapter 27? All right, what are your impressions of Acts 27? Given Paul is right in the heart of the midst of the will of God. And as we go through Acts 27 tonight together, you're going to see that it doesn't look like it, but he is. What are your thoughts, Sister Hines? It's going to be all right. That's right. Anyone else? Acts 27. Who's this? Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Why do you think they didn't want to believe him? Right. That's right. He's a preacher, not a sailor. We'll take it from here. You stick with the preaching. We'll stick with the sailing. We know what we're doing. You don't. But then. <laughs> Had Paul sailed before, though? Remember 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, thrice I was shipwrecked. This is the fourth time he was shipwrecked. And so he was shipwrecked already three times prior to this. Paul knew what it was like to be on the open seas, seasick, shipwrecked. Thank you so much. You're a blessing, a blessing of the Lord. Did you get it? What happened? Both buttons on the bottom? No, there is no. <laughs> if you remember, there we go. Perfect. So we're going to, this is a photo of the ship Paul was sailing on. That's exactly what that is. You're exactly right. That is a photo actually of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It was a massive cargo ship that sailed the Great Lakes for 13 years. It was the largest ship on the Great Lakes. And when you take a look at it, when it comes back up, it really looks like two ships, but it's only one. Yeah, it should, it should go off. Thank you so much, Joe, for taking care of that. It was an all-star ship. The Edmund Fitzgerald made 748 round trips on the Great Lakes in its storied 17-year career. It was built to just haul iron from Wisconsin to Detroit. But something happened on the night or day of November 10th, 1975. Even the experts can't explain. They can't agree on what happened to the Edward Fitzgerald. But what they do know is Lake Superior turned on the ship. 
and claim the lives of all 29 people on board and the largest ship on the lake. Has anybody heard of the song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Gordon Lightfoot wrote it. Here are just, here are a few of the lyrics. And I want to see if these lyrics sound like they could relate to what we're going to read in Acts 27. When supper time came, the old cook came on deck saying, fellas, it's too rough to feed you. At 7 p.m., the main hatchway caved in. He said, fellas, it's been good to know you. The captain wired in. He had water coming in, and the good ship and crew was in peril. And later that night, when his lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And the song concludes, The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down on the big lake they call Gitchigumi. Superior, they said, never gives up her dead when the gales of November come early. These are shipwreck legends and lores, and they form the stuff of legend that ships are on the bottom of lakes and seas. And obviously, people were sailing them, but the ship and most of the time the crew were claimed by the ocean or the, the lake. It's true in history, and it's true, as we're going to see here in Acts 27. Verse number 1, when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adremitin, almost sounds like some kind of medicine you would take if you can't sleep. We put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us, and the very next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put out to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and put us on board. And there is not going to be a quiz over the names of the ships and the people and the cities and the ports. So don't worry. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salomon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lacia. When we last left Paul, five weeks ago, when we were in Acts 25 and 26, when we last left him, he had appealed his case to be heard by the emperor. Felix talked to him, then Festus talked to him, and then Paul said, I'd like to hear what Nero has to say about my case. So today is the day he and the rest of the prisoners are going to haul out and sail across the sea, what should be about a 50-day trip on the open seas from Caesarea to Rome. But Paul is not alone in sailing. He is sailing with a couple of his companions. Did you happen to notice that the, the language changes in Acts 27 from they and he to we? Who just joined Paul? Luke. Luke just joined up with Paul. So Luke is there and another one of Paul's buddies, Aristarchus. He's a guy from Thessalonica. He joins up with Paul. So you have Paul. This is amazing to me. You have Paul, a prisoner, traveling on a prison ship, and yet he's allowed to take two of his buddies with him. That's pretty neat to me. They're going to take care of some of Paul's needs that Paul doesn't have any other wherewithal to take care of. And the scripture says that he's traveling with other prisoners, but there's more flavor to that word other. It literally means others of a different kind. These men who are traveling with Paul, not these men, but the other prisoners traveling with Paul, most of them are condemned to die, so they're traveling from Caesarea to Rome to be put to death. Not Paul. Paul is traveling from Caesarea to Rome so he can be tried and the governor or the, the emperor can hear his case. But the grace of God put Paul on the selfsame ship as men condemned to die so he would have about 50 days to share the gospel with them and they could respond to it before he died. they died. So they set sail from here, Caesarea. This is where they begin. And they travel about 80 miles over here to Sidon and they get it done in a day. So I want to put this on the board because this is pretty, pretty interesting how this all works. So they start in Caesarea and then they go to Sidon. That's 80 miles and they get it done in a single day. They are making good time. Have you ever been traveling somewhere on a road trip and you look down and you realize, man, we're really making good time. We're, we're going to get there early. And then you run into construction yeah. or weather. As they would say in the South, we're getting weather. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen. They're making good time. They get there 80 miles one day. They're doing great. And then they come to Sidon. And Paul is permitted, he has liberty, to go on the island of Sidon or on, onto the, the port and go talk to his friends and go receive care from his friends. 
He's a prisoner. It's a prison ship. And yet it's almost like a cruise ship captain telling the passengers, hey, you guys get off now here at the port. You guys are going to have a fun time. And uh, you'll hear the bell when we're about ready to leave the port. That's how they treated Paul, a prisoner. But when we read the verses from 5 to 8, you can hear trouble coming. You can almost feel the wind blowing. You can see the seas starting to churn. Did you, when we were reading it, did you hear how Luke described the trip? He said, the winds were contrary. We arrived under difficulty. The wind did not permit us to proceed. We passed by the shelter with difficulty. Luke is letting us know this is not a joy ride. This is no cruise ship. This is a rough ride. So they sail from Sidon and they hug the coast until they come to Myra. They come from here and they're trying to stay close to the coast until they come to this place called Myra. And then they leave Myra and they start heading by a place by the name of Snidus. And when they get over to Myra, I'm sorry, I go back to Myra, they pick up a cargo ship that is going from Alexandria, Egypt, to Rome. It's a grain ship. Most of Rome's grain import came from Alexandria, Egypt. So this is just a big cargo ship with room for people. And they're getting all the prisoners on board, and they're going to go over there. So it takes them, we know this, from Sidon to Myra, is about 130 miles, and it takes them however many days. We're just going to say, the Bible says many days, so let's just say six, just for fun. It takes them many days to sail from Myra to Snidus after that. Then they finally dock at a place called Fair Havens. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Fair Havens. Almost like a nursing home. Sunset Meadows. Yeah, you can pronounce this. Not so much, having a little trouble. That one's okay, but Fair Havens, that's easy. But it does. It kind of sounds like a nursing home. We're going to go to Fair Havens. We're going to go to Whispering Hills. We're going to go to Country Meadows. We're going to go to Sunset Meadows. <laughs> Fair Havens sounds nice, but it's not. It's a very small town on a pretty small island, and there are 276 people to look after. Some of them are prisoners on death row. Who wants that job? And they have to winter because... They're making a decision. Do we winter in Fair Havens or do we press on a little more and we make it the 50 miles that we have to go next all the way over to Phoenix, not Arizona. You can see on the map there's a place called Phoenix. Phoenix is bigger. Phoenix is better. It's kind of like if somebody said, okay, for the winter time, you can either hang out in Mount Vernon or Mount Liberty, but you can't go between the both. You've got to stay where you are. I'll go to Mount Vernon every day, all day. So that's kind of the decision they have to make. Small little city, village called Fair Havens, or a place called Phoenix where they have more amenities, more accommodations. But there's one minor issue with these big cargo ships. They're not easy to steer. And so when you get them out into that water, if they get caught by the wind or the current, the storm, it's not going to be pretty for the ship or for the crew. So Paul says when much time, or Luke rather, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, men, here's to Sister Coleman's point, I perceive this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and owner of the ship than the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, that's Fair Havens, the majority advised to set sail from there also if by any means they could reach Phoenix. It was a harbor of Crete opening to the southwest, the northwest. They could winter there. It would be better in Phoenix if they could make the trip. So Dr. Luke tells us exactly the time of the year they're sailing. He says the fast was now over. What was the only fast in the Old Testament where the Jews were required to fast? No, sir, but it is one of the festivals or, or holidays. You got it. The atonement, that's right, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement usually fell on somewhere between September and October. It just depended on which year. That year, many scholars believe, was 59 A.D., and the Day of Atonement was October the 5th. From September... From mid-September, let me get my, my facts right, yes, 
from mid-September to mid-November, sailing was, mm, it's a toss-up. Kind of like Ohio. You never know when it's going to be warm, when it's going to be cold, in the spring and in the fall. But from mid-November to mid-February, it's impossible. You will die on the open seas. And so Luke lets us know when they're sailing. The fast is already over. They're well past October 5th. They're past the Day of Atonement, which means they're in this season right here where it's a toss-up. Should we sail? Should we not? Should we stay? Should we go? Should we winter? Should we try to go a little farther? That's where they are. They've got this decision they're trying to make. Which way should we go? And Paul takes the lead, and he tells them so. And he's, we read from 2 Corinthians that Paul has been shipwrecked. He's a leather worker, he's not a sailor, but he has sailed the open seas enough to know what it's like to feel seasick and shipwreck. And Paul says, guys, if we go, we are shaping up for shipwreck. If we go, we will lose the ship, we'll lose the cargo, and, oh, and by the way, we're all going to die. That's Paul's advice. The centurion says, we hear you, Paul, but what, how about you guys? What do you think? You own the ship, you run the ship, you're the captain. What do you guys think? Can we make it 50 more miles to Phoenix? It's on the same island, and the owner and the captain of the ship both said yes. Paul knows better. They think they know better. He's a preacher, not a captain, so they say, let's try it. Okay, now I want you to pretend like you don't know how the story ends. You don't know if they're going to make it. If they're not, it's a cliffhanger. What is going to happen? Oh. If you don't know how the story is going to end, but you heard the winds were contrary. We passed it with great difficulty. We had to drive slow. We could not get there. It was difficult. How do you feel right now if you're Paul? I <laughs> walk to Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, just leave the ship and walk. It's on the same island. Come on, guys. How do you feel about it? If you don't know how the story ends. So pretend like you don't. How many think they're going to make it to Phoenix? Okay, 50 miles, probably should be one day, same island. How many think they're going to make it? Raise your hand. If you, if you, the sailors did, sure, absolutely, yeah. The sailors say, you know what? It's a toss-up. We might make it. We might not, same island. But here, here, look at this. If we get in trouble, let's just stay real close to the, to the shore. And if we get in trouble, we'll just kind of dock right there at the shore. We're going to be fine. We're just going to go to Phoenix. How many think they're not going to make it by what you've heard and what you've read so far? All right. So you don't know how the story ends. Oh, well, yeah. Now you know how the story ends. <laughs> don't. You don't know how the story ends, but now you do. Okay, questions so far. Questions. That's what Paul's dealing with. Remember, he's in the will of God. Remember, he's right where God wants him to be. Verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocladon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, I love how Luke wrote it. He wrote like a southerner. We let her drive. Just let her drive. Oh, one time we were, it was a winter time, we were, we were heading, we're, we're heading up a, a hill in St. Louisville on the way to church one Sunday night, and it was incredibly snowy, incredibly slick, and we got up near the top of the hill, and our little station wagon could not go any farther, and we knew that we weren't getting any higher up, we were just going to go, so mom and LaShawn and I got out of the car, we're standing on the hill in the ice, and my dad is in the driver's seat, refusing to get out, and we're yelling at him, basically this, let her drive, dad, just let her drive, just let her go, we're screaming at him, just get out, let her go, let her go, but he guided it all the way down to the bottom, but Luke said, we just said, we let her drive, and running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff, here it is again, with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. Fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now they've employed Luke, the doctor, to start working. And now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, listen to these words Luke wrote. 
all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Boy, that's a tragic place to be. When you realize no one's coming to help you, no one's coming to save you, and you cannot save yourself, all hope is gone. So they're waiting for a sign. Fair Havens, Phoenix, stay, go. And the soft south wind blew. And sailors knew what that meant. One more good day of good weather. One more day, that's our sign, let's go. So they pack up, they get everybody ready to go, and they start to go from Fair Havens over to Phoenix. And all of a sudden, as they're going simply from here to here, they run into what the Bible calls a tempestuous east wind. The word tempestuous east wind, that comes from the word, one of the words meaning northern, and then of course east meaning east. And together, what do you get when you take north and east together? You get a northeasterner. Some of your versions of the Bible might even have that in there, a northeasterner, or as they say up in the northeast, a nor'easter. That's a typhoon that hit the Mediterranean in the same exact area where Paul would be sailing on that ship. That's what they ran into. Should have stayed at Fair Havens. <laughs> the storm was so severe, they named it. They named it Eurachlodon, which literally means a nor'easter or a northeasterner when you put those words together. It, we know about winter weather in Ohio, but if you ever go to the New England area in the, the wintertime, you'll hear them talk about the nor'easters, and you hear them talk about how all oh, what you guys have in Ohio, that ain't nothing. You should see what we have up here in New England. There are a handful of places you want to be in the middle of a nor'easter. The open sea, not one of them. So the ship fell into the unforgiving hands of this winter storm, Eurachlodon, and there's nothing the captain or the ship could do. They are in the hands of God now. So they pull in the skiff, a little rowboat that would sail behind it, almost like you would see a little car sailing, or, or not sailing, but a little car towed behind an RV. So they pull in the rowboat, but they do it, but they do it with great difficulty, and they finally get the skiff, the rowboat, in the ship. Then somebody has the awesome task of diving into the water with cables so they can secure the ship and make sure the water doesn't break up that wooden ship. That's one of their ways of trying to keep everything from falling apart. They're doing everything they can do, but they know there's really not much they can do. They're in the middle of a, of a typhoon, and there is nothing they can do to stop it. So they make a very difficult decision. The ship is too heavy. They have to lighten the load, so they threw some of the grain into the sea. Then they threw the tackle. Furniture, beds, chairs, couches, anything they did not need to live, they threw into the water, which is a pretty inter interesting principle here. We change what we value when we are in a storm. What was the grain? Economy. That is these sailors who are traveling with that grain, that is their paycheck. You get that from Alexandria to Rome, you get paid. You don't, you don't. You tell them on a calm, clear day, we're going to throw the grain into the water, they will throw you into the water because that's how they get fed. And yet when it comes to life or livelihood, they're going to throw it overboard. We change what we value when we're in a storm. Reminds me a little bit of how America felt right after September 11th. Remember, go back to that. We had just come off of one of the most controversial presidential elections in our history. President Bush edged out Al Gore by just a couple dimpled chads, thanks to Florida. And finally, a month later, on December 12, 2000, the Supreme Court granted the win to Bush. Do you remember what it felt like in the country during that time? The whole country was divided. It felt a whole lot like we feel now. But nine short months later, on September 11th, after the country was attacked, the country was united. Because we change what we value in a storm. People held each other closer. They held each other longer. They worked less. They were home more. Churches filled up on that Sunday morning in Longwood. We had 185. The Sunday before, we might have had 100. We value. We change what we value. We're in a storm. Somebody a lot wiser than I am said this, never waste a trial. I say whatever it is, whether it's COVID pandemic or it's anything else, let's learn what we need to learn in the middle of the trial. And let's really learn what we need to value, our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, the stuff, the houses, the cars, the economy, the, the bank account, all of that really doesn't have a lot of value in a storm. 
What does have value is am I right with him and am I right with you? That's what has value. So all their life-saving measures, they're not helping. They're tempest-tossed through the middle of the sea, in the middle of typhoon. And the typhoon blocked the sun by day and the stars by night four days and nights. Four, not four, but four, F-O-R, days and nights. They had relied on the stars to guide them. They didn't have GPS or Google Maps or whatever you use, maybe Google Knots, I don't know, on the open sea. They relied on the stars to guide them, but the storm blocked the stars. And they relied on the sun to let them know if they're going westbound, eastbound, where the sun. And they didn't see the sun for days. And then Luke wrote those very sad words we just read a little bit ago. We had finally given up hope. It is all over. We are going to die. But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, I love this. You should have listened to me. And uh, yeah, it's King James for, I told you so. And we should not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and lost. But now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we are going to shipwreck on a certain island. So here, st here stands our pal Paul. They have not eaten for days, not because they're fasting, because they're spiritual or trying to get a hold of God. They're just so seasick they can't eat. There, you ever had a time where you're so sick? flu or anything and you can't eat, don't want to eat, nothing sounds good, smells good, tastes good. And then you think about what you had the night before and you think, oh, I can't believe I ate that. That's disgusting. But two nights later, you're eating it again. <laughs> they were so seasick, they could not eat anything. And Paul does. He stands up in front of all of them, 275 others, <clears throat> and says, you know, I hate to tell you this, but I told you so. I told you at Fair Havens it was too dangerous. I told you it was too late in the year, but you said, no. <laughs> we're captains, we're helmsmen, we own this ship, we know what we're doing. You're a preacher, we're seafaring men, we pre you preach, we sail. And I just see Paul looking at him and say, well, how's that working out for you? <laughs> but Paul did not just say, I told you so. After they lost sight of the sun and the stars and after they gave up hope, Paul said, cheer up, guys. I have good news. We are not going to die. We're going to be all right. Paul, do you know something we don't know? Because we're in the middle of a storm. And Paul says, yes, I know this. God is with us. God is with us in the storm. I read this in my devotion this week, and it was so interesting. I read it. Gideon asked this question. Gideon, one man against, three, or against over 120,000 men in the book of Judges. Gideon and his 300 with torches and trumpets and pitchers against 120,000 ruthless, relentless Midianite and other armies. And Gideon asks God this question. Has anybody ever asked God this question? If God is with us, why are we going through this? Have you ever asked God that question? If God is with us, why this? Gideon asked that question. Paul had to be thinking this. Maybe Luke or Aristarchus might have been thinking this. If God is with us, why doesn't he calm the sea like he did before with just a word? Peace, be still, and your Rockladon has to be quiet. If God is with us, why doesn't he show up walking on the water like he did before? And then the sea has to obey. If God is with us, why doesn't he calm this one like he did for others? Let me give you a principle about God. Just because he doesn't doesn't mean he can't. It doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It just means he knows what is right. So our faith is not believing God will do what we want. It's believing God will do what is right. And what is right and what we want are rarely the same thing. Remember our working definition of faith from a few summers ago? Faith is believing, not believing we won't walk through the water. It's believing we won't walk through the water alone. Or in this case, we won't sail through the water. 
So Paul, Paul tells everybody on the ship, let me tell you what I saw. While you guys were out there looking for the stars, one who came from above the stars came and stood by me this night, and he told me, it was an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, and he told me, don't be afraid, Paul, you will stand before Caesar. I promised you, you would and you will, and because of that, God is going to save your life to save mine. There's a wonderful story about Sister Jean Urshan. She was a wonderful woman of faith, wonderful woman of God. One time she was flying from somewhere to somewhere. She's on a plane up in the air, and it was one of those weather kind of things. The plane's doing this type of deal, and everybody's panicking, and all of a sudden, Sister Urshan, in that trademark baritone, almost bass voice, just yells out, Jesus! And the plane that's going like this goes, and they make an emergency landing, and People are getting out of, the, out of the plane, going to the gate, trying to find out where they are, where they're heading, trying to get their connections. And they ask a gentleman at the gate, it's like, excuse me, sir, where are you headed? And he just looks over at Sister Jean Urshan and he goes, wherever that woman is going, that's where I'm going. If anybody on that ship, I believe they would say, well, if God stood by you and said, you're getting there wherever he's going, I'm going. I'm with him. If God is going to save him and anybody with him, I'm with him. F.F. Bruce made a wonderful statement in his book on Acts. He said, human society has no idea how much it owes in the mercy of God to the presence in it of righteous men and women. This is not an egotistical statement, but we are one of God's greatest gifts to our world. Not individually, as the church. Part of the reason Jesus has not come back yet is because we're still praying for lost loved ones. If we want to hasten the coming of Jesus, I believe if we stopped praying for lost loved ones, he may come. But we're saying, Lord, give us time. We need just a little more time. God, reach for them again. Touch them again. If we stop praying, the world has no hope. But if we keep praying, the world has no idea how much it owes to the presence of righteous men and women in it. So that's the good news, Paul says. We are going to live. We will not die. He probably sang the song. I will live. I will not. But there is bad news. We are going to shipwreck. We're not going to get through, through this unscathed, but we're not going to get through this alone. Any questions before we move on? Verse 27, now when the 14th night had come, how long have they gone without food? Woo. As we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, which really the, that word should be the Sea of Adria. It's a little different region, but that's how it's translated. About midnight, the sailors sensed they were drawing near some land, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. A fathom was six feet deep. So what's 15 times six? 90 is correct. I want you to remember that. So they've gone from this part of the ocean. Now they're getting close to land, and they can hear the breakers. They can hear the waves starting to hit the shore, and they're realizing we're getting closer. So they put some kind of measurement down there, and they say, okay, 120 feet. And a little while later, okay, we're at 90 feet, which means we're sloping toward the shore. Remember that, though. 90 feet. Or a sandbar, that's right. Or a certain death. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, we dropped four anchors. I want you to remember that. From the stern, and we prayed for day to come. As the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. Just something funny, I think, here. I, I heard somebody preach one time a message called, stay in the ship, from this passage. And then somebody else preached a message, you got to get out of the boat, from where Peter walked on water. And I'm going, I don't know what to do. Do I stay in the ship or do I get out of the boat? So where in the Mediterranean is Paul? Here's where they were headed, 50 miles, real quick. We're going to get there in a day. Where is he? All the way over here by the island of Malta. <laughs> you missed it by that much. <laughs> on, 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 some, on some of the maps, it's awesome. Not if you're Paul, Luke, or Aristarchus, but it's awesome because instead of a, a line like this, even curved, it goes like this. Like, that's how they illustrate this is what it looked like when you're going through this. Yes, ma'am.
They tried so hard, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was a nor'easter that came up, the typhoon, and they had no, they, they tried, but they couldn't do anything about it. So Luke said, we let her drive. We just said, okay, take us where you're taking us. So the, north is that way. Right. It was blowing them toward Malta, actually. Right. Away from Malta. Exactly. It's blowing them away. So, in fact, some believe even they kind of turned the ship sideways and it just all the way into the Mediterranean. So, I mean, they are totally adrift. When I, when I see this, it reminds me of our honeymoon where we're going <laughs> from St. Louis to Gatlinburg and we end up in Dayton, Ohio. That's kind of reminded me of how this all works with Paul. So that's where they are. They're trying to get from there to here. They're lost for 14, what's that? That's a great story. I'm actually, I'm, I'm writing a book on the Beatitudes, and that's one of the chapters. Yes, so buy my book when it gets published. So they're trying to get there. Now they're 500 miles off course. It's taken 14 days, but there's good news. They are close to land. Bad news is they can't steer the ship. So you're getting close to land, finally, but you can't steer the ship. So you're probably going to run aground, and you're going to shipwreck on the island. So they do. They take the recordings and they find out we're 120 feet. They take another one. We're, we're 90 feet. And then they said, well, here's what we're going to do. At 90 feet, we're going to throw out four anchors. We're going to stay right where we are. We're not going to go any farther. We're going to pray for daylight so we can see where we're going. And we're going to wait, which is smart. They do. They pray for daylight. And then a few of the crew, I love this, Luke tattles on these guys. They they go, hey, well, we're going to go back real quick and we're going to put the rowboat back in the water just to make sure everything is okay. they got their gear with them, their backpacks. <laughs> like, where are you guys going? Oh, we're just going to put the rowboat in the water. And Paul says, oh, they're trying to escape. And the centurion says, no, 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 no. You put the rowboat in the water, you come right back here. So their escape plan is gone. And they put the rowboat in the water, the skiff, and they cut the ropes. There is no escape plan. They are in this. There is no going back. Paul says, stay on the ship and live get in the rowboat, and die. So as the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day. You've waited. You've continued without food. You've eaten nothing. I urge you to take nourishment, for this is your survival. You guys are going to die of the shipwreck. You're going to die of malnourishment. Since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Some scholars believe Paul treated this like a communion service. He took bread gave thanks to God and said, thank you, broke it and gave it to the prisoners. So some see this as a communion service. Then they were all encouraged and took food themselves. And in it, in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. So Paul tells them, you guys go ahead and eat up. And they do. This is where Luke rosters that they had 276 people on board the ship. And they finished their breakfast. And they threw the grain overboard. They're trying to lighten the ship to try to keep it safe and try to make sure they don't run aground. Now, again, it's all about life. It's not about livelihood. Forget the grain. Forget the paycheck. We're going to worry about that later. Right now, we just want to live. When it was day, they did not recognize the land but observed a bay with a beach under which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go of the anchors. At what depth did they let go of the anchors? 90 feet. Meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes and hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. I'm impressed with Luke. He's a doctor, but boy, he knows these sailing terms. They struck a place where two seas met, and they ran the ship aground, and the prow struck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves, and the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship, they'll get to the land. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. So once again, they let the anchors go. They're, they're holding the anchors in place to keep the ship from going ashore. It's daytime. They can see where they're headed. And they say, okay, go ahead and let the anchors go. Cut the ropes. We don't need them anymore. We're going to go ahead and let the, sh the, the ship go with the waves and get onto the beach. Let her drive. And they're going to go right here on the island of Malta. But here's what's so very interesting about the island of Malta and the anchors and the depth and all of that. The biblical archaeology 
Search and Exploration Institute, which is called the Base Institute. They, they document that they had divers who went down into the sea on the sea floor, or they actually document that there were divers. They didn't have them. There were divers who went down, and they found four first century anchors at 90 feet deep. Now, the tragedy is they didn't know what they were, they were looking for, and they found. So two of them, they melted down into weight belts for a scuba gear. One was lost, but they did preserve one of them, and they gave them to the BASE, and they talked to a doctor, Anthony Bonanno, to authenticate it. They just wanted to know, tell us when this is from, tell us who would have used this on what kind of ship, and here's what he had to say. What you have just shown me is, to be precise, part of an anchor called an anchor stock, which is lead and an essential part of a typical Roman anchor. Its flourishing period would be around the first century A.D., though its use would have spanned from the first to second century A.D. back to the second or third century B.C. It would be considered universally Roman and could have come from a ship from Rome or Alexandria. And of course, a ship would have several of these. They found these four anchors at 90 feet deep off the coast of Malta, just as Acts 27 says they would, all within 40 yards of each other. So all of them came from most likely the same ship at the same time on the same beach. It's an amazing confirmation biblically of, of the, the true story of the Bible. So the centurion, they realize they are going to run aground. They realize they're going to break up the ship because of the where the two seas met and they're going to run aground. So the centurion, his plan, or the soldier's plan under the centurion's rule, is to kill the prisoners. Why? Why would you do that? And what would happen if they did? Life for life. Any prisoner who escaped, it's your life for theirs. So if the, if the centurion or the soldier let the prisoners escape, it's their life for theirs. But the centurion doesn't want to hurt Paul, knows Paul, believes Paul. Oops, I told you so. So the centurion tells the soldier, no, 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 don't harm any of them. Nobody dies today. We're going to save them. So he tells them, the ones who can swim, swim. Get out of the, get out of the ship and get into the water and swim to the land. <clears throat> well, the ones like me who can't swim, grab all whatever you can, whatever driftwood, whatever whatever piece of the ship you can, you, whatever you can find, and you ride it like a surfboard to shore. And when they got to shore, they did a head count. They started with 20, 276 men on the ship, and they ended with 276 men on the shore, all alive, somewhat well, but all safe. Nobody died, nobody escaped, and God's word proved true once again. God told Paul, nobody will die. Nobody did, and God's word was true. Any questions? So yeah, for this lesson, the message is stay on the ship. But when you talk about walking on water, well, man, get out of the boat. Any questions about Acts 27? Any thoughts on Acts 27? Talk to me about being in the will of God. Maria. What was your question? They wanted, the ship to, they wanted the ship to go toward the shore. With the anchors in the water, it was just standing still. Kind of like putting all the brakes on. Exactly. And if they pull up the anchors, you've got more weight. Remember, they threw the grain off. They're trying to make it as light as they can so it will It'll be higher up. Yeah. Now, those anchors were massive. Massive, massive. Good question. As far as where the ship is, it's right off of Malta. There, there, many scholars believe that it is in what's now known as St. Paul's Bay. But according to the BASE, they've taken a look at everything in Acts 27, and they're using it almost like an investigator would take evidence and clues to find a suspect, in this case, the ship. And they believe they found it in a different location than what's known as St. Paul's Bay. And that's where they found the anchors. So they're probably right about that. But yeah, the ship, the... Shipwrecks are so interesting, and so the stories that go around shipwrecks are just so interesting. <coughs> any, any questions or thoughts or comments on Acts 27? Well, Paul used the proper lingo because they didn't believe him when he <clears throat> was in his first shipwreck. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Y'all are going to believe me when I tell this story. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Learn the lingo. That's right, that's right. 
I know what's going on here. I know what it feels like. As we began that chapter, did you feel the foreshadowing Luke is painting in Acts 27? Winds are contrary. It's difficult. We're going slow. It's not good. You can just feel like this is not going to go well. And then they say, nah, let's leave here and let's go to Phoenix. You're like, oh, this is not going to end well. Well, you guys got to think, Luke is a doctor. He's a realist. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not, it's not that he doesn't believe that God can take care of it, but he knows what he's seeing. Right. He's, yeah, he's, just show me the facts. And I, the facts tell us this is going to cost us dearly. Could even kill us. If God wasn't with us, we would, we would have lost our lives. So far, Jesus or an angel has visited Paul several times. That encourages me. If Paul needed a visitation like that, hey, we're in good company. Maybe our faith doesn't soar all the time and we say, Lord, if you could just show me something. Paul did. Paul, when he got to Corinth, remember that? Paul was about to give up. He was done. He left Athens early, came to Corinth. He was just done. And the Lord said, Paul, I've got much people in this city. Just stay here. Everything's going to be fine. Nobody will attack you to hurt you. He had to tell Paul, everything's going to be okay. And he does again here on the ship. Okay, so now that we've just gone through 27, I want to show you those lyrics again. And let's see if any of this situation and shipwreck sounds familiar to what we just read with Paul's ship. When supper time came, the old cook came on deck saying, fellas, it's too rough to feed you. That sound familiar? And at 7 p.m. a man hatchway caved in. He said, fellas, it's been good to know you. We had lost all hope. The captain wired in. He had water coming in. The good ship and crew was in peril. And later that night, when his lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The legend lives on from the Chippewa and down to the big lake they call Gichigumi. Superior, they said, never gives up her dead. When? The gales of November come early. Sound familiar? That could have been Paul's story, really, except for they wouldn't have called it Gitche It would have called it have been the Mediterranean. <laughs> 50 miles from Fairhavens to Phoenix. No. If anybody knew where they were, where they were headed, and knew that they were, cost, they were caught at sea, they would have already said, we've lost them. We've lost 276 men. Yeah, there's no way they lived. And yet they show up in Malta. Hey, everybody, we're here. <laughs> there were people that, um, if, when they, you know, they know we're getting on the ship, Paul's getting on the ship. Paul has been in three shipwrecks. Right. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Maybe Paul's one of those guys where it's not wherever he's going, it's wherever he's going, I'm going the other way because he's been shipwrecked three times. That's right. That's right. That's right. What's that? It could have been, and that's what the soldier thought it was going to be. It was a prison break, and they were going to get onto the island of Malta, and they were just going to scatter but they did not. First off, the centurion wouldn't let them kill the prisoners, but all the prisoners were there, and they got on another ship. We'll see that later. In, in Well, actually, we won't see that in Acts 28, but they got on another ship, and they ended up going to Rome. So there are at least three ships, if not four, that they're going to go on. And it, it's kind of like, it's almost a little bit, it's almost a little bit here when they start, like a bus route. They're going to pick up some people here, here, here. Well, we're not going to go to Snidus, but we're going to come over here to Fairhaven. It's almost like they're picking up people on a bus route. They're just going to go from here to here to here to here to here. Public transportation. Until they, until they go to... to hear about their trip to three taverns. Three, ta oh. <laughs> three taverns. Yes, yes. That's where they really got sick. Right. <laughs> Hey, good luck on pronouncing any of uh, most of those, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want pizza too. Let's all go to Ron's. 
Well, here's what I want us to pray. I want us to pray that we would be in the will of God, and that is a difficult prayer to pray because this sometimes looks like the will of God. <coughs> sometimes this is the will of God. Hey, we made it in a day. Sometimes this is the will of God. We're not going to make it at all. And yet, God is with us. So I want us to pray that God would help us to be in his will and keep faith when it doesn't look like what it should look like, that we still trust God is with us and he has us in his hand. Let's pray that tonight. Jesus, I thank you for giving us the story. Thank you, God, for your kindness and your faithfulness to us. Even when life turns out like it did for Paul, I want to stay close to you, Jesus. I want to be right in the middle of your will. No matter what that looks like, I want to be in the middle of your will. Help every one of us, God, individually, as families, as a church family. Help us to be in the middle of your will and help us not to lose our faith or lose hope but help us, God, to trust you. You are with us. You are for us. I thank you tonight, Lord Jesus. Use us for your glory. Give us a testimony of what you have done in us, what you have done through us, God, what you've brought us from and through. And may we ever give you glory and thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, next week, <laughs> it's fair week. We need as many as can help us, especially on Wednesday night, out at the fair because it is rough truck night and because of that, there'll be so many people. We need your help parking cars. If you could, please, if you have not yet signed up, if you would, just to give us an idea of how many we're going to have at each crew in morning and evening, if you would sign up at the Welcome Center before you leave tonight, I would be most grateful. If you can't work every night or every morning, but just one, please sign up. We need to know we're going to have enough people, so we will know we have enough people. <laughs> yes, yes. And that is coming up Sunday night. We're going to be out at the fairgrounds starting parking at 4.30 and then 6 o'clock on Monday morning. We'll be policing the grounds, picking up the trash, making it clean for everybody. Any questions about that, about what we're doing for fair week? We do, yes. Sister Donna Lehman and her team are doing breakfast. Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Oh, for those of you who, who work in the mornings, you'll be so, I may be happy to know this, they spent $400 on brand new sh shovels, rakes, and brooms for us. Brand new. At the end of this week, they will not look like it. But at the beginning of the week, they will look like it. No, they're not painted orange. I'm sorry. I know. We can. <laughs> yes, that's possible. So it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. So if you brought an offering, let me give you the offering basket. You can drop your offering into this offering basket, and you are free to go. We will not have class next Wednesday because it is fair week, but the following Wednesday we will finish Acts with Acts 28, where we get to see what happens in Malta. That's an interesting story, too. You are dismissed. Thanks for being here.